Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Good evening. Friends, thank you for being here tonight. I should say friends, family, colleagues. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm Andrew Schwartz uh, here at CSIS, and it's an honor to be here with two of my bosses, my immediate boss, Dr. Hamry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Bob Schieffer, who's brought me along for the ride uh, on a lot of adventures, including this book, our podcast, uh, the Schieffer series, and you know so many other things. Um, we would like to thank the Nyarkos Foundation, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation, who make this series possible. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do the Schieffer series, wouldn't be able to do our podcast, we wouldn't be able to do the book, and we're really, really grateful to them. Um, we're also grateful to the TCU Horn Frogs and a little place called the Schieffer College of Communication down at TCU, who are our number one supporters and our, our, our favorites. Um, I'd like to thank our publisher of our book, Roman and Littlefield, who's also here. And we'll be signing uh, and some books afterwards. So, you know, buy about 15, you know, for the holidays. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, tonight is a really, I, I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to personally thank, before we get started, Dr. Hamry and Bob for really doing this project. It's amazing. Um, when it came to this night, I was, I was a little nervous and, you know, I, I got, my, my wife and kids can't be here because my middle son is quarterbacking um, the JV football team right now for Sidwell Friends and so they're all doing that, <laughs> right? And so. You know, but my friend Craig Cohen here, who's our EVP, made me feel better about it. And he said, you know, chances are without you there, he's probably gonna play better. <laughs> and I thought to myself back when I was a kid, you know, I was leading the team in high school and hitting, and you know, everything was going great. And then my dad finally got to a game and I struck out three times. <laughs> well, the only problem is my dad's here tonight. <laughs> So I'm going to try not to strike out. But with that, let's, uh, let's have a great night. Thank you for coming. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. And I'm delighted. First of all, I'm delighted to have all of you here. Um, I walked around and just talked to colleagues and friends tonight. And everyone was excited to be here. And I think it's because everyone here is part of the Bob Schieffer fan club. I mean, I, and we all, uh, let, yeah, he's a good around in the club. Uh, we, uh, you know, at a time when there's so much questioning of uh, the authenticity of news, we have had Bob Schieffer for this country being a trusted and authoritative voice for all of us. And I, I just have to say thank you to Bob for that. Well, thank um, you. <laughs> um, now, I, I um, normally when I do book events, uh, you know, I, I try to skim the book so I don't look too stupid when I ask the questions, you know. And, uh, but this is a different case. This is a case where I had a chance to watch the authors develop the book. I, that's not happened to me before. I had a chance to interact with them and uh, to see early drafts and to see how their, the texture of their thinking was changing. And so I want to try to help all of you a little bit through this journey. Uh, and let, let, let me start with both of you uh, because there was a precursor to this book. Uh, it was a series of podcasts that were done. It was called In the News, I think it was, that was uh, with Bob Schieffer and Andrew Schwartz. And uh, it started off with a series of interviews. By the way, you all ought to look at them. They're all available at, on our website. But very interesting, insightful interviews with leading figures in the world of journalism. And let's start by saying, why did that happen? Well, um, it, it happened because of you, Dr. Hammer. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, true. it really did. You know, uh, one day uh, we were here and uh, uh, Andrew and I were having uh, coffee with Dr. Hamry, and we were talking about this communications revolution that's going on and how it is, is really changing our culture. And I knew it was changing our culture, but as we got into this book, I came to understand it was changing it even even more than I had realized. But during this conversation, Dr. Hamry said, you know, information and uh, what's going on in communications now has actually become a national security issue. 
And I'd never really kind of thought of it in that most serious terms, but that really was when I began to think that maybe we could mold these podcasts and the reporting. And basically, we, we did 44 podcasts, I think it was, about once a week, and they were the basic reporting for this book. In addition to I was out, you know, covered all the debates and covered the campaign and uh, had traveled around the country last year. Uh, and added to it, but the podcasts were really the uh, the basic reporting for the book, and it was a really good way to write a book because we were kind of facing a deadline every week. We had to come up with a podcast, and you know, when you have a deadline, then you have to do it. You don't you don't put it off till the next day, and so so that's really uh, how it came about, and it was it was really a, a fascinating, uh, uh, and sometimes. <coughs> You know, you come away from things like that uh, feeling good about some things and, and really worried about other things. And that's, I think, the more we got into this one, the more worried I became. <laughs> it was, uh, and this, uh, I guess this was over, it took me uh, probably over a year mm -hmm. to write it. But mm -hmm. most, you know, the reporting was done during the campaign, from the campaign trail, and then in these podcasts, but it was it was a very interesting thing. I know a lot about the old media. Andrew uh, knows a lot about the new media, so uh, he was kind of my guide on that front and understanding digital and uh, some of these organizations that, quite frankly, I, I'd never heard of. I mean, to tell you the truth, this is how illiterate technologically I am. When we started these podcasts, I thought they were called iPods. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew pulled me aside one day. It's it's podcast, <laughs> but that's true. <laughs> so Andrew, tell about the technology side, because you, you are yeah. from the new generation. Sure, and yeah. you know, it's interesting because digitally native news websites, web uh, news organizations that were born on the web, and by those I mean Politico is a good example, Vox.com is a good example, BuzzFeed's a good example. We write about all those in uh, the book. These are news organizations that have never been in print. They were born on the web. They all feature multimedia. Three-fourths of them currently have podcasts. And podcasts have become such a huge way of communicating. In fact, you know, 45% of American adults have now listened to a podcast. If you want to listen to our podcast, it's called About the News, and it's on, uh, it's on iTunes. It's also on our website, and it's pretty much available anywhere you listen to podcasts these days. Podcasts have become critical um, in terms of news reporting, and you know the the, the top podcasts get about five thousand downloads a week. So you know ten percent. CSIS now has twelve podcasts, half of which get five thousand or more podcast uh, downloads a week. And I knew that it would be a really great way for us to start on this project and examine what the media landscape was like and how it had changed and how it changed during the campaign. And so basically what we do is we set up a microphone and we get some really interesting people to come and talk to us and we have a conversation. And it's something that you can um, listen to on demand. You don't have to listen to it live. You can listen to it whenever you want. It's basically radio on demand. So the, the thesis of this book or, or what this book is about uh, is this, we have access to more information than any people who've ever lived on the earth at any, any one particular time. Uh, but the question is, are we wiser or are we simply overwhelmed by so much information uh, that we cannot process it? And the answer at this point is we are overwhelmed. What we are in the midst of, and Walt Mossberg, one of the people we interviewed while we were writing this book, said uh, in the interview with us, he said, sometimes when you're in the middle of something, you really don't understand how significant it is. Well, we're right in the middle of it, and we're in the middle of a technological revolution that is having as profound an impact on our culture as the invention of the printing press had on the people of that day, and we all think back about the good things about the invention of the printing press. Obviously, mm -hmm. literacy improved all across Europe. We had the Reformation, we had the Counter-Reformation. 
What we sometimes forget is that we also had 30 years of religious wars before Europe settled into some sort of an equilibrium. We're right in the first trimester of this revolution that we're going through right now. We're nowhere near equilibrium, but it is changing everything about our culture and nothing has been changed more than, than our politics and how we get mm. the news. And let me just tell you, uh, Dr. Hammer, mm -hmm. it's a long answer to your first early, early question. Yes, that's great. But some of the bad news about this revolution is the impact that it has had on newspapers in this country, mm. which were for so many years the traditional way that most people got their news. We have lost 126 newspapers in the last 12 years. In 2004, one reporter in eight lived in New York, Washington, or Los Angeles. That number is now down to one reporter in five. One reporter in five lives in one of those three metropolitan areas. So what we're seeing now is, you know, we always have these arguments and are still having them about, about uh, uh, bias news. In many parts of the country now, and especially up through the Rust Belt of the country, uh, it's not a question of bias news. They're not getting any news. They're not getting reliable news because the traditional sources that they have depended on over these many years have simply uh, gone away. 62% when we started writing this book were getting at least some of their news on social media, Facebook. That, I believe that number now is up to 67%. And to some people, that is the only source of news that they're getting because those of us in the, this room, most of us uh, are, I wouldn't call us elites, but we're at the upper, upper levels uh, in both education and, and, and uh, in financial uh, status and so forth. Uh, we can afford the apps. I get the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal on my phone. I get CNN on my phone. I get all of the news apps. But if you're a minimum wage worker, uh, you probably have a phone, but you can't afford the news apps. Uh, you probably no longer are able to afford cable television uh, because uh, the rights fees have gone so high. You may have a television set in your home, but many times your only contact with news will be uh, what your browser kicks up accidentally uh, on your phone. So this, and this is one of the problems we're going to have to address in this country as, as in the coming years, is how, how do we close the gap between rich and poor, black and white uh, minorities? Uh, how do we close that gap? Because where we're headed right now, we all know we have a great divide in this country, but we are going to, that divide is going to get wider as we come to depend more and more on electronic uh, means uh, upon the phones. Bob, can I take yeah. that? This, you just opened up, you, you just answered five of my next questions. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but let me, get, let me dig down into what you started off as a, as a journalist and you had an editor yeah. that was asking you tough questions. Is this true? Yeah. What are your sources? Where you, you know, we, We've all grown up in an environment, in a news industry, where the news was trustworthy because it had editorial discipline behind it. What's happening today well, with editorial discipline in news? Uh, this, this, this is the big change. Uh, social media is great. Facebook is great. Uh, it's a good way to keep up with your neighbors. It's a good way to send news around the world and back in a matter of seconds. But we have to recognize that the news we get on social media hasn't gone through the same vetting process mm -hmm. that one would traditionally expect uh, from, from the mainstream media or from our traditional sources of news. And that's, again, one of the reasons for this, this great divide. I mean, when I was coming of age, when I was growing up and working at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, most towns in America had three television stations and a pretty good newspaper. And you didn't always agree with the editorial policy uh, uh, of the newspaper, perhaps, or the commentators you might hear on television. 
but you assumed that what they put in the news sections and what was on the front page had been checked out, that they didn't print it or broadcast it unless they had convinced themselves it was true. Well, now that's no longer the case at all. And, and now when we have 700 uh, channels on the television dial, when we have even more websites uh, on, the, on the digital media, if you many times look to this source over here for your news, you get one view and, and one set of facts. And if you look to this source or read this source, you get another set of facts. So what has happened, and again, this is what is leading to this great divide in this country. We're no longer basing our opinions on the same common data. Right. Everybody brings their own facts to the table. Uh, people tend and have in recent years since the rise of cable to, to go to the news uh, many times not to find the news but to uh, uh, validate their preconceived notion and they, they stick with that source while the guy who lives next door is going to another source. So this is really, I mean we're really in a, in a place where I think we've never been in the world before and it's going to be a way before we get through it. I mean, I think in the end, the bottom line, uh, the culture will be, be strengthened by all this, but we're not there yet and it's going to be a bumpy ride until, until we get Everybody there. turn your phones to stun, okay? So it just zaps you rather than lets all of us know you got a call. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, mo most Americans, recent studies by Pew and other organizations have shown that most Americans don't trust the news anymore. Most Americans don't trust the information that they're getting from institutions anymore. And what we're dealing with is, is something called the new shape of the truth. And that's a problem because, like Bob said, um, people are picking and choosing their facts based on where they're aligned. You could sit in a bar or restaurant and look at two different TV sets, both covering the same news conference, and see completely different reporting on the lower third. And I was doing that actually a couple weeks ago and watching the White House news briefing and one network said um, President Trump hails uh, the new jobs report. The other channel said uh, White House amid firestorm over uh, X, Y, and Z. And that's pretty big polarization and therefore, you know, and, and you, go to, you go online and it gets even worse. You go online and you really don't know what to trust. Nine in 10 US American adults are getting their news online. So we have a problem with the new shape of the truth. Exactly, and it's not true, a lot of it. And that, that's because, I mean, you know, for years in this country, we've had the conservative channel and the liberal channel and uh, the in-between channel and the vegetarian channel and all of that. <laughs> but now, uh, stuff pops up that is just absolutely made up and made up on purpose. I mean, after this awful thing we had in, uh, in Las Vegas uh, recently, uh, within hours, I would say within a half hour, there were reports on the web that the shooter who was first misidentified uh, in many places, but that the shooter had recently converted to Islam. Then, and then he was part of ISIS, and then he was part of Al-Qaeda. And I saw this thing about him converting to Islam, and I thought, well, I, I didn't hear that on our report. So I called, I called the office, I called CBS, and I said, could that be right? And they said, oh, no, no, the police uh, said absolutely no truth to that whatsoever. This had been made up out of whole cloth, but it looked real enough when I saw it on my phone that I checked it out. I mean, and, and, and we're seeing that over and over now, and, and that is the big, the really big problem is this just fake news. Made up, made up for profit, made up for propaganda purposes. There is no question that the uh, Russians uh, were involved in this stuff, were buying ads, you know, on Facebook at one point, uh, and, and all done for a purpose. And so, you meld that all together with all this information we're, we're getting now, and it's no wonder people say, who can I believe? Who can I trust? Because a lot of the stuff out there is, is just simply false, and here's the real danger of this. Once it gets out there, 
you simply can't take it down. And the, the most recent example of this, well, uh, the most famous example is that Barack Obama is not a citizen of the United States. Now, how many, how many fact-checking uh, exercises do you have to do to prove that that's not so? But there is a percentage of people in this country who still believe Barack Obama is, is not a U.S. citizen. This poor man that owned this ping pong parlor out here uh, uh, on, uh, on Upper uh, what is it, Connecticut, uh, where you know the report was that Hillary Clinton was running a child pornography ring in the basement of this ping pong parlor. And it was Pizza thoroughly parlor. discredited thoroughly discredited, it had no basis in fact, and yet someone came from another state and shot a doorknob off the door that he thought was to the basement because he was going to go down there and rescue the children. Well, there isn't a basement in the ping pong parlor. That, again, was just false. He has been arrested. He's in the criminal court system right now. But that man who owns that place still has to hire private security because he is still getting death threats from people who still believe that that, that that story is true. And once it gets out there, and that's what's so different now, Dr. Mm -hmm. Hamry, and what we have dealt with in the past, this stuff moves so fast uh, that uh, you can't knock it down, you know, uh, before it's gone around the world. It was Mark Twain said that, you know, a lie goes around the world and back while the truth is still putting his pants on. And that, that, is, that is more true now than when, when Mark Twain uh, said it. And, and that is, and it goes to your point, uh, this is a national security It matter. is a national security. Yeah. Let me, there's a very interesting, for me there's gonna be a slightly longer setup for this question, but it's a serious question. Uh, there was an interesting book written about 10 years ago called The Geography of Bliss. And it was uh, written by a journalist who traveled around the world trying to ask the answer the question, why are people happy? You know, and all happiness research comes down to on a scale of one to ten, are you happy or not? You know, ten being high, one being low. And the, the Happiness Museum is located in Amsterdam, so he started there thinking they, they all chew funny brownies, and that made him happy. And, um, and but they were pretty happy there, but it wasn't that. He went to Iceland. You know, I said, why would anybody be happy? My dear friend, the ambassador from Iceland is here, so forgive me for saying this. <laughs> that, you know, why would you be happy in Iceland? It's just dark all the time and fermented whale blubber is your menu. You know, why would you be happy? But they're very happy in Iceland. People are happy in Iceland. Went to Moldova. Nobody's happy in Moldova. You know, he went to Nepal. Poor as could be. Everybody's happy. So it wasn't connected with climate, it wasn't connected with wealth of a country, it wasn't connected with quality of food. What made people happy? The answer was interesting. He said, in societies that had a great deal of trust, people were happy. So what's happening to us? Well, there's a growing distrust, there's a growing divide. Uh, there's, we've become a, uh, I would say, a ruder, uh, more short-tempered, less patient uh, society. And uh, I mean, that, that doesn't have any, that, that just has to do with our culture. And I think this has been building for a long time. And I think now with the coming of all this misinformation and bad information, uh, I, think it, uh, I, think it is, I think it has made us a, let, a less happy nation. I mean, I, I really uh, sincerely believe that. But, there's another part of this, and that is, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been out pumping this book for about the last three weeks, and, and I, I always, you know, people always ask me the question, uh, well, how do you feel about always being under attack by the, uh, by the government now? Uh, and, and my answer to that is, you know, I was here when uh, Vice President uh, Agnew was call, calling us nattering nabobs of negativity. <laughs> and uh, just the other day, someone called me a, a, a female hygiene device. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I've been call, called everything that you can. And that, you know, uh, you could call anybody. And as, as a reporter, that's just part of the game. We, we don't pay any attention to that. What does concern me is when people, whether they're in the highest office in the land or in the darkest corner of their mother's basement, 
uh, try to destroy the credibility of a free and independent press. Uh, because when they do that, uh, they're, they're trying to uh, shake the very foundations of our democracy. Uh, and when young reporters, when I talk to them, I say, look, you don't get in an argument with people. You ask them questions. We're not the opposition party, as some would like to label us, and nobody I know in journalism thinks that we are. What we are is reporters. Politicians deliver a message. Our job is to check out the message, find out if it's true or false, and then report on the impact it is going to have on the government. That's the assignment that the founders gave us under the First Amendment. When we do that, I mean, I don't take myself very seriously, I try not to, but I take that responsibility very seriously as a journalist. That's, that's what the founders meant for this, this country to be about, and I would argue you cannot have a democracy unless citizens have independently gathered information that they can compare to the government's version of events, and then people will decide what to do about it. When we, journalism's a lot of fun. I can't think of anything I'd rather do than be a reporter, and I've had a life, I mean, I've, I've been truly blessed. Uh, but when we do that part of it, uh, that's, we're performing a real service for democracy. That is as crucial to our form of government, I think, is the right to vote. So when people try to do that, I take that part very seriously. I mean, one of the reasons I think people are so anxious to get to the bottom of the story about Russian interference is that it basically suggests that uh, our opponents have learned how to weaponize our news industry against us. Mm -hmm. do, Andrew, how does this work with fake news? That's amazing, Dr. Henry. Um, even today, we heard that uh, tweets trying to affect what's going on in Spain right now have gone up 2,000%, 2,000% virtually overnight. And the people who told us about this attribute it to um, Russia. Russia has been doing this. Th th this, is a, this is an old game out of their playbook. In fact, our colleague Heather Conley has a, a great report out called the Kremlin Playbook, which is on our website. And it talks about how the Russians and others have been at the disinformation game and the fake news game for a long time. Because of electronic media, because it used to be the barriers to getting into news were difficult. You know, everybody knew what fake news looked like. You just had to look in the supermarket and there was the, the, the National Enquirer. And there was, you know, aliens come to get George W. Bush, right? So that's, that was fake news. Well, now you can go online and something can pop up in your social media feed on Facebook, uh, can pop up on Twitter, it can pop up in an email to you, and it's beautifully presented. It's clean. It might even have a URL that says abc.com.co. That's not ABC News. People, though, will believe it's ABC News because it's abc.com, and the story will look so professional that it'll say, well, you know, Denzel Washington has uh, joined the Trump campaign. People believe it. I believed it when I saw it. Real smart people, people who are some of the top, uh, people who are some of the savviest, most literate news consumers are fooled by fake news because it is so professional looking and it's clever. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, there was a story uh, going around during the campaign uh, that in 1996, Donald Trump had given an interview to People Magazine, right. and he had said, uh, if, if I ever get into politics, I'll become a Republican because they're the dumbest people on earth and they believe anything on Fox News. Well, you can imagine this began to get a little pickup from some of the more left-leaning organizations. There was, and it, it, the, the only problem with the story was it was totally false. It had been made up out of whole cloth. They had, uh, with graphics, reproduced yeah. what looked like a cover of People magazine. Uh, it looked, everything about it looked real, except it wasn't. It was, it was totally false. Uh, this, 
This stuff kind of really, in journalism, we began to notice this on 9-11 uh, is where we first began to notice. I can't tell you how many times, and sometimes this was just mistakes, but I can't tell you how many times stories would, would pop up on 9-11 that said there's another, there's another plane headed toward the Sears Tower in Chicago. At CBS, we would stop everything we were doing, we would check it out, determine it was not true, and then broadcast that it was false. Well, this, this is a real change for, for journalism organizations. Before that time, when we made a mistake, we thought it was our responsibility to correct it and correct it as quickly as we could. But if, an, if, if a competitor made a mistake, we simply ignored it. We didn't report it, and we waited for them to correct it. But we found out on 9-11 that, that we had to uh, knock down these stories immediately. And we must have knocked down this story about another plane headed toward the Sears Tower six or seven times you know, in one afternoon. But we had to because if we didn't knock it down, uh, we ran the risk of setting off pandemonium and, and, and rioting in the streets. And so our role as journalists changed really on 9-11 and, and we continue with that. But we've become so overwhelmed now and this stuff is so sophisticated now. Uh, there are people that are making millions of dollars. Uh, it's, it's much more profitable. Uh, to manufacture false news. You don't have to go out and do any reporting, you just make it up. Uh, it's much more profitable uh, than it is uh, to report uh, straight news. So there are many different reasons that this is going on, but Andrew is exactly right. Uh, you know, Joe Nye, uh, who's a national security expert up at Harvard, said, said he had no, uh, there was no question in his mind, and the evidence suggests, that the, the Russians uh, were meddling in our, in our election. Uh, he says probably simply to destroy credibility in our electoral process and to raise questions about the validity of that. He says they got Trump as a bonus, whether they were on his side or not. Uh, he thinks maybe they were just, you know, just trying to dis destroy the credibility of the system itself. But, I mean, we, we don't know the answer but, to that. But isn't there also the underlying reality that it, it's, newspapers have lost money. They've been, trying to, they've been trying to hold a balance sheet. They've been cutting their editorial staffs. They've been cutting back on their bureaus. Well, they, that's, uh, that's what's happened. I mean, you know, the ads, especially want ads, that were the lifeblood of these newspapers, especially uh, at the medium to uh, or smaller cities uh, newspapers, uh, that all went away. That all went away to uh, eBay and to all these other uh, uh, places on the web. So they were unable to find a, uh, an economic model uh, to keep uh, operating, especially to keep operating with the number of people you, you need to uh, do investigative reporting and, and that sort of thing. The good news, and we haven't talked about that yet, right. is that the big newspapers led by the Washington Post and uh, the New York Times have totally reinvented themselves now. Uh, they are no longer paper newspapers. Uh, they're no longer newspapers, they're media companies. And they're, they're providing their product 24-7 now on, on a variety of platforms, uh, whether it's a newsletter, as, right. as uh, Andrew was talking about, the, their digital product, where the, the circulation of the paper Washington Post is about 400,000 right now. They are sometimes reaching as many as 70 or 80 million people with their digital product. Uh, the Post has become a national newspaper and is becoming an international newspaper like the Times uh, because of, of this the way that they have invented themselves. And if, if newspapers are gonna survive, and I think they will, I think they will eventually survive as, as, uh, as, as, as uh, on, you get them on the, online, on the web, not, not on paper. I think a great deal of the credit is going to go to Jeff Bezos, uh, who bought the Washington Post and, and has the best newspaper editor in America, I think, Marty Barron, uh, and he's letting Marty run the newspaper. 
and, uh, and he's a tremendous influence and has a lot to say about the newspaper, but he wants it to be the best newspaper in America, and uh, it's certainly one of the best two in America mm -hmm. right now. The Times is right there with him, and you know, the press took a lot of heat during this campaign, but the New York Times and the Washington Post, for those who read them, found out a lot of things that you wouldn't find in, in other places. I would think the two of them got most of the scoops of the campaign mm -hmm. of significance. Andrew, but you, that's all exactly right. I mean, but journalism is in a process of also reinventing itself in terms of the different models. One of the chapters we have in the book and that Bob wrote about is uh, the Texas Tribune, which is a, which is a daily uh, online piece, uh, online news organization that just covers politics in Texas. And it's, a, it's basically like NPR. It's a, it's a reader-supported model. They're succeeding, and it's something that can be scaled across the country at the local level. Uh, as Bob said, we, we're seeing the Washington Post and the New York Times reinvent themselves as news organizations and media companies that do visual journalism, that do audio journalism, that have crossword puzzles, but not just crossword puzzles, they have interactive crossword puzzles. Um, we're also seeing things like, I have a chapter in this book called uh, Newsletters. They're so old, they're new. Newsletters actually predate newspapers. But I would bet most people in this room get some form of a newsletter sent to their inbox every day. I get about five, maybe more. And it's a great way of consuming the news. Monetizing the news is a different story, and that's what everyone in the news, in, in the news business is worried about, is how do you sustain this kind of journalism? But the New York Times has shown, the Washington Post has shown, and the Texas uh, Tribune has shown that subscriptions are up and that people will pay for good quality journalism. If you make it really good and high quality, people will pay for it. It's still about the story. It's right. still about if you have information that other people need and that they consider relevant in their lives, uh, then you can have a successful uh, news organization. But these newspapers have been hit so hard. Here was one of the most stunning statistics that I ran across when we were, we were putting this book together. In 21 of the 50 states, there is not a single newspaper that has a Washington correspondent. Now, you know, the National Press building down there used to be full of these regional newspaper reporters. They're not there anymore. They're not there anymore. And I think, um, you know, one of the reasons, uh, one of the people, and I don't know if he's still here or not, but I did a chapter about him uh, in the book, Peter Hart, who's kind of the dean of our pollsters. And uh, polling, polling took a lot of hits this time around. And again, it goes back to this change in communications. Uh, when, when I first went to work at CBS, we, we in our polls as good as anybody's, uh, the CBS New York Times poll, we would call 3,000 people in order to get 1,500 people. And 1,500 people is a, is a very good random sample of a country, 1,500 people. We, we had to call 3,000 people to get 1,500. Now we have to call 30,000 people to get 1,500 because people just simply won't talk to anybody on the telephone anymore and, and there are no landlines. Most young people you know, don't have a landline. Uh, they, that's become a very generational thing. Uh, so the polling, there's no question it's not as good and that's one of the things we talked about in the book. And, and it's simply not as good. Uh, they did on the national poll, they did pretty good. They, they had Hillary Clinton winning and, and she won uh, uh, the general election. But of course, they, they didn't get it at the, uh, in, the, in the battleground states. And I think one of the reasons for that is that uh, Peter said, and I quoted him in the book, he said, you know, we depend so much on analytics now and all of this, and said you can learn a lot about people. You can learn about their shopping habits. You can learn about what kind of shoes they like. You can learn about all kinds of things. But he said, you can't tell what's in their hearts. And, and I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of people didn't pick up on uh, what Trump was doing out there and how that message was getting through and how Hillary Clinton's wasn't. And again, it goes back to the uh, reduction in staff in newspapers. 
in the old days, newspapers, yeah, they, in the local city, they'd know, well, this is where all the Republicans mostly live, and here's where the Democrats live, and they'd send their reporters out to just knock on the door and, you know, take the temperature. They would send reporters to the opening of the new car dealer and ask them about politics, and it not only helped them get a better feel and an understanding uh, of the people in their community, but it also generated a lot of talk and got people to talking politics. Nobody has enough staff to do that at a local newspaper anymore, and so that's why we see more, more and more they, they lean to these polls, and uh, they're just sometimes not getting uh, what, what really is in people's hearts. I think, I think uh, we are gonna have to do more focus groups uh, and just man on the street kind of interviews to buttress what we're finding in our polls because you know if, if you have to call 30,000 people to get 1,500 uh, I don't care how you weight it you still have to ask who are those 1,500 that were willing to talk to you uh, on the telephone and uh, whether you, whether you can decide that they represent the feelings in their community is is a question we really don't know the answer to but, right now. But, but could I just ask though it, it, it seems to me that there are positive antibodies that are growing. I mean, yeah. we've heard so much talk about fake news now for the last year, but the subscription rate for the Washington Post is up 100%. Mm -hmm. The fastest growing group of subscribers are millennials. Absolutely. Yep. The subscription rate for the New York Times is up 100%. Uh, the PBS NewsHour viewership, they're no longer advertising Geritol or advertising younger drugs, mm -hmm. you know, for younger people. You know, <laughs> uh, you know I mean, it's, there's, there's clearly more energy in the traditional channels. What, how do you sense this when you are talking to colleagues in this industry? Well, I think it's right. I mean, I think, and I think young people are, are very, very smart and, and, you know, they may not read a paper newspaper, but, but they're getting information and they're getting the apps and they have access to it and uh, in the upper economic levels uh, they can afford it. But it's just like back when, when John Stewart and Colbert first came on the scene and, and some people thought this was a threat to our constitution because they said, you know, these young people, that's the only place they're getting their news is from John Stewart. And, and my answer to that was, look, if you don't know what the news is, you're not going to get the jokes that John Stewart tells. So they're getting the news. They know what the news is. And, and Stewart and Colbert, to me, were like the, the editorial cartoonist at a, at a newspaper, who is the only person at the newspaper who has the right to lie and does consistently, because that's what parody is about, taking one thing, thinking things one step beyond where they are to help us have a clearer understanding of maybe of what they, they ought to be. So uh, to me, I thought, I thought they were helping people to be, become more educated and more politically aware, and it didn't bother me at all that, uh, that uh, young people were watching. Yeah, young people are some of the most adroit consumers of media. Millennials, those under the age of 35, I mean, for them, this is their television. This is their newspaper, this is their magazine, this is their primary news source, and it's with them all day long. Uh, you know, I don't know about any of you, that whether you have teenagers at home or not, I do. It, it, this barely ever leaves their hand. I just wish they wouldn't look at it when they're crossing the street. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's true. That's, part that. that's true. But that they're really obsessed, bothers me. like the rest of us, they're obsessed with the news, and mm -hmm. they're getting it from disaggregated sources. They're not just getting it from the Times and the Post, and the news hour, they're getting it from Vox.com, they're getting it from their own media like Mike.com. And it's a very exciting time for them and it's also a very exciting time to be in journalism. There's more students in journalism schools today than there were 10 years ago. There's an explosion of people who wanna be journalists. That's a great thing. And what we're seeing is, is we're seeing um, new and creative ways of delivering the news um, and of uh, producing the news. But like Bob said, it always comes down to the story, the narrative arc of the story. I think Maureen Dowd said to us in our podcast that whether it's delivered by homing pigeon or by you know, electronic, it, it, if the narrative arc of the story isn't there, no one's going to read it. No one's going to pay And that's to right, it. because we worried too much in journalism about what the news is printed on. 
Is it printed on paper or, or is it on the web or something? What, what we need to continue to be worried about is the content. The content is, is, is the important thing, and that's what, what makes for a successful uh, journalistic uh, operation. I mean, at CBS now, we've started this thing called CBS In, which is a 24-hour news service that you only can get on your phone or only can get on your computer. And, and uh, there are, were times during the, uh, both the Republican and Democratic convention uh, in 2016 when we'd actually have a larger audience or a larger number of people watching that than we're watching CBS, uh, uh, the CBS network. So there are all these things that are going on and how all this is gonna shake out, uh, you just can't say at this point, but I think in the end uh, it, will, it will strengthen our culture, but it is having a tremendous impact right now and much more so uh, on our politics and, and, and how we get the news than, than we've come to realize. We've got some microphones here in the room, so we'll take some questions. Uh, let, let me come right down. Ma'am, we'll put you right there. Yes, you. Please, uh, there's a microphone coming. Please use that. Thank you. Uh, with this fake news, if we discover the people who are faking it, is there anything to be done about them? Are they punished at all, or is it considered freedom of speech? It's, it's a very, very difficult problem. But something, uh, yes, uh, only now are Facebook and Google uh, admitting that yes, they are news organizations. I mean, I don't think they'd even call themselves that, uh, uh, but they are admitting they do have a responsibility uh, for, for what appears uh, on, on, their, on, on their site. Uh, in the beginning, they said, look, we're a technology company. We, we don't have any response. This is not our responsibility, what people use our technology for. Well, when you have 67% of the American people that that's where they're getting at least some of their news, and some people are getting all of their news, there has to be some responsibility. And it's very difficult, but at least they have begun to address it. Uh, some people are, are you know, talking about regulations and all of that. I, I'm not sure how one would regulate it. It, it would it'd be very, very difficult because you do have, you know, you do have the First Amendment side of this. I mean, do we want to outlaw parody? No. I mean, do we want to outlaw political discourse? No. Uh, but we have to find some way to at least let people know, you know, or get, put a flag on it. This is not true. F Facebook and, and um, Google and other um, social media companies have found, are finding new and creative ways to mark fake news. In fact, there's been a study that shows when, fake, when Facebook actually marks something as fake news, 85% of the people who see the story discount it. So it'll work. One of the biggest problems is, is that people in Silicon Valley b truly believe that there's an algorithmic solution to this. There, there's not. There's just not an, you need a human editor. Now the problem is, is how do you, you can edit the Washington Post, you can edit the New York Times, you can edit Vox.com. How do you edit billions of people who are on Facebook? It's a really big problem. And if you ask Mark Zuckerberg, how do you do it? He will say, I don't know. But you know, I mean, and this is how it's all changed. I mean, when I came into to journalism, uh, they, there was a big controversy about whether uh, journalists ought to be licensed like doctors mm -hmm. and, and lawyers. Mm -hmm. And the answer, our answer was no. The First Amendment is our license. If you've got a barrel of ink and a printing press, then you're a publisher. Well, it's still, we still believe that, but you don't need the printing press anymore and you don't need the barrel of ink anymore. Everybody who has a phone is now a publisher, and uh, so this is a new and totally different world but, that we're but, all operating. But we did have we did have a legal norm that said if you intentionally publish something yeah. that was false, sure, you could be sued. Yeah. Why can't we bring this into this new domain? Well, how do you number one? How do you? Uh, I, I agree with you, Dr. Hamry. That, that's exactly what we have to do. But how do you? Uh, sue some kid that doesn't have anything. I mean, it's just sitting in mama's basement at three o'clock in the morning and finds the meaning of life. And, how do you and, even find them? And, and how do you find them? Uh, how do you, uh, 
you know, once you find them, uh, you know, if, if I say something wrong on CBS, it's libelous. CBS has deep pockets. A person has a recourse. But what is the recourse you have uh, to someone like that? And that, that but we is, could go after this character down in Texas that was publishing yeah. blatantly false news, and they did, and he's, yeah. he pulled back a bit. And they, and they pulled back. Uh, but it's uh, how, you, how you regulate this in a meaningful way uh, without violating somebody's uh, First Amendment mm -hmm. rights. Is, it, it's a very, very difficult problem. And while they are doing some things, it, they're a long way from solving this That's problem. Right. And uh, okay, question going to be with us. Yes, sir, over here. Well, yep. The microphone's coming to you. Okay, thank you. I'm a reporter from China. I'm just uh, wondering, uh, have you observed uh, the uh, the uh, team f uh, of international correspondents for leading U.S. newspapers and networks shrinking this uh, this years, and what is the impact of the change? Thank you. Go ahead, the question is, is is are international are, are U.S. international correspondents shrinking? The amount of U.S. correspondents around the world. That's the question. I think there are probably more right now. Th there uh, is would more. be my guess because yeah. there are so many organizations now. Uh, and I mean, some of these uh, organizations like uh, BuzzFeed, for example, exactly. uh, is just one name that comes up. They have hundreds of people that work at these organizations. When kids say, you know, the newspapers, uh, the number of newspapers is shrinking. Uh, and that's true, there are fewer newspaper jobs now, but there are jobs for journalists out there because there are so many of these organizations now, and some of them, of them are quite successful, and some of them are, are quite good, as a matter of fact. P Politico, for instance, yeah. has an entire Brussels Bureau and Politico Europe, and it's one of their most successful properties. And they're thinking about expanding that to Politico Asia, Politico Middle East. Um, it's a great development. But you know, the, the difference now is, is my boss, David Rhodes, often said, we used to have to hire all these people to go out and find the news. Now we have to hire an equal number of people just to sort out the news we already have. Right. And the stuff that's coming, right. coming into us, you know, over the transom and under the door and, and just from every, every nook and cranny. It's just, it's there all the time and it, and it, never, it never stops. Okay, if you're in the second row, uh, let's get right here, yeah, please. Thank you, Bob. Earlier, you talked about uh, a shift away from the mainstream media into a new social media that most people are using. Do you think that the co-opting of the term mainstream by one half of our ideological spectrum has turned people away from what would be considered mainstream media? And if so, how do we reinforce and uh, reinstill trust in the mainstream media. So maybe we just need to change the name. I mean, you know, it's like when, for, for, remember when Trump first was gonna change Obamacare and somebody said just change it to Trump Care and go on? Maybe, maybe that's what we need to. You know, I, I call it the mainstream media. Other people call it legacy media. Uh, some people call it the old media. Um, I, I don't know, I think news is news by any name. I guess. But, but I mean, you're speaking to the larger problem you're speaking about is, you know, our colleague Bill Brock, Senator Brock, former USTR, former Secretary of Labor, former head of the Republican Party, says that people no longer um, go to the news to get their information. They go to the news to get ammunition. And there, there is a certain number of people who do. How about right here? Yes, right here, ma'am. Right down the front. Hello, uh, my name is Jackie, and uh, I've often heard that the 24-hour news cycle is a blessing and a curse. Uh, so my question is, do you think that this emphasis on constant content is uh, in any way diluting uh, the quality and the focus of the coverage? Um, and do you think that in any way has contributed to the dismantling of trust among the public? You mean just the fact that there is so much? There's so much information. Yeah. Like, is there, is there exactly. less emphasis on well, the you know, maybe is, investigative reporting? You know, the, the good news is, that we, as we said a couple of times here, is we have access to all of this information. And we can get it out there so quickly. 
But the bad news is the nuts can all find each other now. And I mean, and they have. And if you ever, I don't care how bizarre or how strange your view of anything is, you can find somebody out there that agrees with you. And he, he probably knows somebody else and she knows somebody else. And then you have a little, a little group there. So it's called a quorum call. A quorum <laughs> call, as Dr. Amory said. I said that. But I, it is. I mean, you know, more is not necessarily better. I mean, here's, 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 here's the deal right now. We have all this information, but we're short of curators. That, that's, that's where we are here. I mean, what is a newspaper? It's a curation of the news of the day. What, you know, what is a radio newscast? It's a curation of the last hour. What's the Encyclopedia Britannica? It's a curation of what somebody thought was all the knowledge in the world. And uh, that's part of the, what we have to do now. We have to, we have to learn how to curate this information and sort it out. And again, that, that is the role of a free and independent press. And that, that is kind of what our job is. Sometimes we're better at it than others, but I think, uh, I think the United States would be worse off if we didn't have that uh, rather than that we do, which I think is one of the real foundations of our democracy. We're at the hour where we're going to close because I do what both Bob and Andrew have agreed they're going to stay a little while longer to sign books for people that still want to buy them. I just would, before I let you thank them, let me just ask everybody to pause and think about how crucial it is for your day-to-day -day work to have trust in the people that you interact with whether you, you buy something in the store and you trust that the ingredients that are printed on it are truthful. You, you, uh, you decide you're gonna buy some stock and you look up uh, what the stock, what the company says and you trust that. Sure. Everything in our lives depends on trusting uh, in the same way with our politics. And unfortunately, we're in a period of great questioning of that. We've never had a time when we've more needed responsible, curated news than the era that we're in right now. And we should all just say thank you to Bob Schieffer, to Andrew Schwartz for having given us a little well, guidebook you. on how we should look at it. Thank you. Thank you.